been imagining what it would be like if Alfred Wallace himself, as a sinewy, crotchety, still strong 90-year-old, as he was just 100 years ago, could be sitting with us here, could be sitting in the front row listening to this, to this Rashomon view of him on all of his various different aspects. And, and what I pictured was, he, I think he would appreciate it, he would, he would appreciate the fact that we appreciate him, but he wouldn't be able to contain himself, I think. Maybe he would have a cane. I think he would be standing out of his chair about every five minutes and saying, yes, but, <laughs> yes, but, because the story would always be a little bit richer and a little bit more complicated. So I'm going to focus on just three aspects of his character, and I think these serve as useful categories for understanding why he's been so warmly re remembered. And he has been warmly remembered by science historians, if not by the general public. I think sometimes that you know, we, we all keep talking about how, uh, how Alfred Russell Wallace was occluded, was, was overshadowed by Darwin. And he's, it's really reached the point where he's, he's a man who is famous for not being famous, um, or not being famous enough anyway. But he has been very well recognized. Uh, during his lifetime and in, in recent decades. But uh, to understand why we're here gathered to venerate him, I think uh, these three categories, it's Wallace is a risk taker, Wallace is a field biologist who was also a conceptual biologist, and Wallace is a writer. I think the first cardinal point in, uh, in his biography is that for him, uh, as for Will Shakespeare, and as for uh, Leonardo da Vinci, but not for Charles Darwin, impecuniousness was the mother of invention. And what I mean by that is simply, he was a man with empty pockets who had to earn a living. We've heard he came from a middle-class family, fallen on lean times, in which he was the eighth of nine children. He had to leave school, age 13, uh, Andrew told us about that, and immediately, having left school, he went to work. That's 1837. And Darwin, in that year, was a young gentleman of 28 who had just come back from his voyage on the Beagle, his four years, nine months, and five days on the Beagle expedition. That Beagle voyage had been a very strenuous adventure. There wasn't always the coach and four waiting for him, but it was... Uh, it was relatively comfortable compared to, to what Wallace would later do. He was subsidized by his, uh, his wealthy father, um, the obese and formidable Dr. Robert Darwin. Uh, Wallace had no such subsidies. So he worked at various different jobs, England, Wales, for more than a decade. He did some land surveying with one of his brothers. He did some construction work with another. We've heard that he hired on as a school teacher in the city of Leicester. And in the meantime, he educated himself as best he could with the help of town libraries and working man's institutes and a few precious books, including that botany that was mentioned and a manual of British Coleoptera, a few precious books that he could afford to own. Uh, he read Humboldt's Travels, he read Darwin's Journal of the Beagle Voyage, he read Malthus. Uh, there's, there's some names and some themes that have been recurring all morning. Malthus, uh, Humboldt, um, Ternate, Vestiges, Variation, and, and I will uh, come back over some of those. Um, so he was educating himself. Um, reading all that. He may have read William Huell, another name we've heard this morning, the philosopher of science who'd recently published his History of the Inductive Sciences. Uh, in that book, Huell had said, species have a real existence in nature and a transition from one to another does not exist. So better if, uh, if Wallace hadn't read Huell, as a matter of fact, because, uh, because that dogmatic view of the external fixity 
of species. A transition from one to another does not exist, as Hugh will put it. Um, that was the prevailing wisdom of the day, and not just among religious thinkers, but among scientists too. And that uh, obviously tended to discourage evolutionary thinking of any sort. Wallace did read that provocative bestseller, Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation. Um, it was not a good book, as a Andrew or one of my other colleagues has said. It was full of woozy ideas about a law of development in living creatures. Um, and uh, it was published uh, anonymously, although it was written by Robert Chambers, published anonymously in 1844. It talked about how some, how uh, one species somehow transforms into another one uh, in incremental stages from simple life forms into complex ones. Um, that idea was rich, it was promising, uh, but the book was also filled with factoids and mistakes and confusions. Uh, Darwin, again, as you've heard, read it and thought it was a half-baked nuisance, casting uh, discredit on the very idea of transmutation, which he was working on secretly. It may even have been one of the things that contributed to that delay, that long delay by Darwin. Uh, Vestiges came out in 1844, and Darwin backed off a bit. Um, uh, but Wallace, who was younger, uh, by 14 years, more impressionable than Darwin, Darwin liked Vestiges, as you've heard again, for that ingenious hypothesis. It was an incitement to him. Um, so he got together with Bates, his pal in Leicester, and they cooked up the plan to go to the Amazon, of all places, to collect data to look for a possible mechanism for this kind of thing. Um, and you've heard about the trip to the Amazon. Now, I mentioned Wallace's risk taker, taker. That trip to the Amazon, age 25, was the first of three great risks that he took in the course of uh, his magnificent quest to understand how the world works. I'll talk about the other two uh, in a minute. Uh, among the most important things about that Amazon journey was that unlike Darwin with his wealthy father, um, Wallace had to finance that trip as he went. So he and Bates worked out an arrangement with this broker of specimens, you've heard him mention, just, uh, just barely, uh, the faithful Samuel Stevens of Bloomsbury Street. Uh, so Wallace and Bates would ship back natural history specimens to Stevens, and he would sell them to museums and private fanciers. And there was this vogue at that time for keeping cabinets of natural history specimens, the way you, um, if you could afford to, you might keep a, an early Picasso sketch or a, or a very, very authentic uh, African mask on the living room wall. But for these cabinets of natural history specimens, butterflies, uh, beetles, again, something that has recurred all morning, beetles, and, uh, and birds were mostly what was wanted. And if those creatures were rare and gorgeous, all the better. So the Samuel Stevens sold to that trade, and Wallace became one of his intrepid young suppliers. The significance of that commercial arrangement uh, I think went far beyond the fact that it brought Wallace money, cash that he needed to buy manioc and machetes and to live during his years on the Amazon. Uh, collecting for commerce, as well as for science, put him face to face with one of the critical realities of living creatures, and that's intraspecific variation. Um, the Amazon, you've heard, the Amazon uh, adventure ended badly. The boat sank. He lost most of his, uh, almost all of his the specimens that he was bringing back with him, most of his notebooks. Uh, and uh, he wrote to a friend that he, um, he would never trust him more, never trust myself more on the oceans uh, after that experience. Days in a lifeboat, and he got an, on another boat, supposedly a rescue boat. That one almost almost also sank before he got back to England. So he was saying, I'm through with oceans, but he couldn't keep himself away with field biology. And within just a few days, he was planning his next trip, and within 18 months, he took off again. And this time, he went east to that world of islands um, that uh, was known as the Malay Archipelago. Uh, and that was the second great risk of in 
every kind of boat, from mail steamer to Bougainese trading prow to dugout canoe. When he was on shore, he lived the way the local people lived. He sheltered in thatched houses. He ate whatever could be traded for or bought. He made stops in Sumatra, Java, Bali, Lombok, Borneo, Celebes, Jilolo, Ternate, Bacian, Timor, Saram, long, long list of islands that he visited. Uh, and also a little cluster of islands called Aru in the far eastern extremity of the archipelago. One of the things that has seemed curious to me is that he also sailed right past the island of Komodo. Here's a man who's out there looking for prodigious natural history facts. He sails right past the island of Komodo, and there is nothing, at least as that I've been able to ever find, in any of his work uh, about this giant lizard, the Komodo dragon. He, he didn't catch wind of it, apparently. Uh, in some places, he hung out for months. He did this in Sarawak and also on Aru, uh, netting butterflies, grabbing beetles, shooting birds, processing his specimens, processing his impressions, and uh, healing his infected feet, dealing with malaria bouts, waiting for the rains to end or for the winds to shift. Uh, he... Uh, packing up his specimens, learning a bit of the Malay m language so he could, could do business. Uh, and whenever he would reach port, a big port, for instance, the one on Ternate, uh, he would ship boxes of specimens back to Samuel Stevens in London. During that eight-year expedition, by his own count, he gathered 125,660 specimens, of which 83,200 were beetles alone. Uh, he did have an inordinate fondness for beetles. Uh, from, uh, just from the Aru Islands, with its birds of paradise and its other special attractions, he brought away more than 9,000 specimens. And those were assignable to 1,600 different species, more than a few of which were completely new to science. The numbers from Aru, rep reflecting a ratio of specimens to species, of almost six to one signal this a critical fact about the way he worked. Um, the fact that he was a commercial collector as well as a natural historian. He wanted multiple specimens of a given species, not just one or two samples. He wanted these multiples, especially if the species was visually impressive, like the, the bird wing butterflies, the longicorn beetles, or the birds of paradise. Uh, back in the Amazon, he had taken 12 specimens of that spectacular flame red bird, the Gyanin cock of the rock. Andrew showed a picture of it, Rupicola, Rupicola. He took 12 specimens, and he admitted that he would have taken 50 if it hadn't been uh, so, so rare <laughs> and elusive. We don't collect like that anymore. Uh, in Aru, he was likewise greedy for as many specimens as possible of the greater bird of paradise. And still later, when he was on the Maros River in Celebes, he got six good specimens of a swallowtailed butterfly, one of the largest swallowtailed butterflies, uh, known as Papilio androcles. Uh, it has long white tails dangling down uh, from uh, its hind wings like streamers. <coughs> from the island of Waju, uh, just offshore from New Guinea, he harvested 24 individuals of the red bird of paradise. He had two purposes for collecting these multiples. One was to represent each species in his personal collection uh, with a good series, his term, a good series of individuals. Though it wasn't even clear to him at the beginning of his uh, work what a series of individuals might imply. His second purpose for collecting redundantly was simply to as mass as many as possible of the most decorative species for Samuel Steven Stevens to sell. The important but unintended consequence of that redundant collecting was that Wallace saw and recognized, um, and to a degree that Charles Darwin, uh, during his own field years, had been much slower to see and recognize this momentous fact about creatures in the wild, intraspecific variation. He saw that each species encompasses differences among individuals. 
he saw that there is no ideal type, no God-fixed pattern for each kind of creature. Um, he saw that um, not every specimen of that swallowtail butterfly, uh, Papilio androcles, has tails as long as w and white as every other specimen. He saw that not every greater bird of paradise is quite as great as every other. He saw that individuals within a species vary from their conspecifics. They vary even from their siblings uh, in ways that are visible and ways that might even be significant for survival. And of course that insight is crucial for the idea of evolution by natural selection. Um, variation within populations. Darwin had seen plenty of it among fancy domesticated pigeons, which is one of his research interests back in England, spending time with pigeon fanciers. He, Darwin, had been slower to see evidence of it in the wild, uh, and that came only during that long eight-year project on the classification, redoing the taxonomy of barnacles. One of the things that bedeviled him, Darwin, when he was doing that, was the fact that there was variation within species. It was the first time he really became aware of it in the wild. Wallace started later, but he got to the idea of natural selection by a shorter route because of economic imperative. Uh, he was a commercial collector. He constantly saw variation of wild creatures within species in his inventory. So he put these ideas together. Variation plus Malthusian population pressure, not enough food, not enough habitat, uh, equals differential survival. Differential survival yields adaptation. He sketches that chain of logic in that famous 1858 manuscript, the Ternati uh, manuscript, um, after his brainstorm during the malarial fever. And he writes in that famous paper, most or perhaps all the variations from the typical form of a species must have some definite effect, however slight, on the habits or capacities of the individuals. A giraffe with a longer neck than other giraffes would feed a little bit better. An antelope with weaker legs would be less likely to escape from predators than uh, another antelope of the same species. The result would be successive variations departing further and further from the original type. Adaptation, divergence, evolution. And so he stuffed the manuscript uh, into the letter, into an envelope and mailed it to Mr. Darwin back in England. I'll go to the third great risk of Wallace's life. And this is one that, um, like commercial collecting, uh, was both a choice and a consequence of necessity. Uh, from the time of his arrival back in England in 1862 until his death in 1913, just 100 years ago, Wallace lived without steady employment. He never had a full-time job. He was a freelance writer, poor bastard. <laughs> he scrambled and scrounged to pay his bills. The trustee Samuel Stevens had had some money waiting for him uh, when he got back from the Malay Archipelago uh, from sale of all those specimens, but uh, he lost most of that in unwise investments through uh, shifty advisors. He helped support some members of his family, including his mother. He tried, Andrew I think mentioned this, he tried for a couple of tempting jobs, um, Secretary of the Royal Geographical Society, uh, museum director, later superintendent of a forest reserve, and he didn't get any of them, couldn't get those jobs. He worked part-time for more than two decades as a school examiner. Uh, but Wallace couldn't afford to set up as a gentleman researcher working long years in obscurity on labors of love. Again, the contrast is obviously with Charles Darwin. Wallace couldn't afford that. He had no trust fund. He had no portfolio of railroad stock. He had no connection by marriage with the Wedgwood pottery fortune. So he kept himself busy as a freelance author, writing articles, writing books, a steady stream of these things. And some of which were much better than others. 
this gave him intellectual satisfaction, uh, we assume, but zero security. By early 1869, he had a wife and two children. That year also, he published the Malay Archipelago, um, his greatest book, uh, certainly one of the greatest travel and natural history books of the 19th century, or I think it's safe to say any century. Uh, but even that book didn't make him rich. In 1880, when he was still struggling financially, Charles Darwin stood up for his old partner in discovery, along with some other colleagues, and lobbied hard and successfully uh, to get Wallace a special civil service pension. Now, this wasn't quite a MacArthur grant. Uh, it brought him 200 pounds a year. That's a lot more in those days um, than, uh, than it would seem today, but still 200 pounds a year. Uh, I think the best way to think about that is it was his social security check. Um, so this diversity of uh, his later career and all the vectors of his thinking that I was mentioning before, uh, they can be seen through the list of his publications. Uh, you've heard about the Malay Archipelago. You've heard about the geographical distribution of animals that was published in 1876. Island Life, another, another very important, um, valuable book published in 1880. University of Chicago Press has just brought out a new edition of that. Uh, edited and annotated by the island biogeographer Lawrence Haney. Um, uh, and with those two books, having already um, joined uh, Darwin in founding evolutionary biology, Wallace became the founder of another far-reaching field, evolutionary biogeography. Uh, in doing that, he helped us to under understand why creatures live where they do and not elsewhere, and what those patterns of distribution tell us about the history of life on Earth. And that, that's not a bad accomplishment to rank number two uh, on a man's resume. His bibliography also includes contributions to the theory of natural selection. That's 1870. In 1875, Wallace published Miracles and Modern Spiritualism. Land Nationalization, the title of his 1882 book, another of his passions. Darwinism. 1889, Man's Place in Nature, 1903, and Is Mars Habitable, 1907. And then in 1913, just a, a hundred years ago, the year of his death, at age 90, he brings out two books, not just one, on democracy and social issues. Um, impressive output, impressive diversity of output, and as who was it? Charles mentioned, titling his 1889 book on evolution, Darwinism, signaled uh, one of those steady, admirable verities about the character of Alfred Russell Wallace. He was thrilled with the theory of natural selection, evolution by natural selection, without needing to see his own name on the label. Now, I'll finish with, with one thought. Why does a man... Going back to 1907, why does a man at the age of 84 write a book titled, Is Mars Habitable? There was the, there was the canals, there was the Percy level uh, uh, um, theories about it, but uh, I think that there's uh, probably another reason and one that we shouldn't uh, overlook. Um, Wallace was still an impecunious freelancer. He was living by his wits. He was pitching ideas. He was needing subjects and publications of one sort or another just to keep the pot boiling. You gotta love him. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>